very very valuable skill. Although, sorry, go ahead. You have people who are very engaging and who have passion and who are entertaining. But I also think that there's a poetics to it. Though. I guess I'm looking for people who are going to be passionate about sharing their passion. Through the power of his imagination, he will offer us revelation. The revelation that he offers us is an imaginative reworking of scripture, okay? This is the point, this is why I've been emphasizing that term, transumption. Milton reads scripture actively. He reads it, understands it, reinterprets it, and reshapes it, okay, within the analogy of faith, and that's what he's doing. I was really quite moved by the eloquence of, of the lecture. But then I kind of felt it, it sometimes was too subdued, as if there were points where he had me in the palm of his hand, but he wasn't taking advantage of that. And I thought that, that was most uh, uh, demonstrated by the quote, that I almost wished he had the quote memorized, because he had me and then lost me when he went back to the podium, but then had me again halfway through the quote, and that his voice was so commanding that if he just kept moving, if he had the book in his hand even, to read that quote, it, it would have it been a lot better than it was. He may not have wanted that. He seems to me to, the, to be a very shy man. Mm -hmm. it, obviously, it's silly watching a lecture to come to a conclusion like this, but he seems to me to be a very moral person, very mm -hmm. decent. The way that he said to the, the class when someone started to giggle, yes, I know it's obscene, there was something very honest about that. Yeah, I thought it was really, he was very passionate. It was kind of this sad passion that almost made you tearful. It moved you in that kind of a way. Uh, I felt he really conveyed sort of the divinity of the work. And there's a sense of power. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's talking about scripture, but you also get that sense of uh, spiritual power, that he's being spiritually moved. And I felt spiritually moved, you know. I have to say I have a bias towards that kind of historical context. But I really felt, you know, he, I really felt totally uh, taken in. How long have we known each other? Since 76, what is that? 33 30 years or something. Yeah. I remember when we stood on that spot in Victoria College, right outside the door to Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. You were wheeling your bicycle, you were wearing a babushka, you had a, a, a grey uh, Macintosh on. And my wallet. And you had your wallaby shoes on. It was a very sexist world and I had to make sure that no one ever, ever, ever looked at me as a woman. And I thought, oh, she looks nice. And I didn't have anything other than that. I just thought, you look, I thought, oh, she looks nice. And you said, yes, I'm Lynn Magnuson. And, and I uh, live with my boyfriend. And you live with my boyfriend. And it was like, so, so keep your keep hands it, off and, and don't away. get any, keep any bleeding away. ideas no. in your head. And I felt, you know, I didn't have any ideas no. then. The ideas came later. <laughs> I haven't lived permanently in Cardiff uh, since I was 18 or 19. I, I don't think I've ever left Cardiff. I think that Cardiff is, uh, um, you know, it's just just a powerful um, uh, shape in my mind. We're uh, very much a working class family. It was a, a large extended Catholic family which was obsessed with uh, getting on. Uh, it had a very strong sense that the, the ways in which um, uh, you could improve your condition was through hard work and education. The radio always seemed to be on. There would be all kinds of wonderful things that my mother loved, which were the science fiction things like Journey into Space. You would get things like um, Sherlock Holmes, and uh, at the, uh, you know, in the next program on, or a bit later, would be one of Plato's dialogues. But the actors were the same. So there was a way in which uh, Plato's dialogues were kind of um, you know, assimilated back into popular culture. The radio was, uh, was both a powerful communal thing, but it was, both, but it was also a, a, an amazingly effective educational thing. It certainly gave uh, working class people, you know, like my family, a sense that they were not to be limited by class. My father left school when he was 12, and, um, but my father read a lot. And there's no question that he had an extraordinarily acute mind um, and was passionate about uh, that we should do well. You know, my mother loved the idea of imagination. She constantly talked about imagination, and she, her argument against my father was that he was not imaginative enough. My father and I fought uh, all our lives 
Um, and I think the problem was that we were simply too much alike, which is a familiar issue. He spent the war in uh, the, the, uh, the local regiment, the, the Welsh regiment in the, in the Western desert in Italy and Austria. And he didn't particularly like the war, but he loved the regiment and the community of the regiment. And so it was family, uh, um, uh, parish, and regiment. We went to, to St. David's Cathedral, yeah. you know, on the, on the yeah, eastern coast, because this is a cathedral that's built um, in a kind in a of in a dip. It's n right near the ocean, but you can't see it from the ocean. So that the, the Vikings. Vikings, they wouldn't see it when they went past. So that brought together our two <laughs> heritages, my Viking background and his Welsh <laughs> background. Right. I was ready to go and rape and pillage like the well Vikings. <laughs> You've got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're much more meek and mild. The meek, yeah. the meek and mild, mild Welshman, right. sure. <laughs> when I finished A-level, instead of going to university, I, I enlisted in the army. There was a way in which joining the army was, was the most obvious way in which you, um, you become something. You, you acquire an identity which is of value. When I failed to, to get a commission after six months, I had the option of leaving the army or staying uh, for uh, another two and a half years. And I was so infatuated with the army, just loved it so much, um, that in despite of all those kinds of things, uh, I decided to stay as a soldier. I commanded a rifle platoon in, in Belfast for um, uh, seven months, and um, we did our best to do good by uh, the people that we were uh, there trying to protect, the Catholics and the Protestants. You were always so proud of having come, uh, come out of the army, and you were always trying to tell people about this and thinking that oh, the, graduate, the reaction of all oh. the graduate students would be, would be, oh, that's amazing. And, that and of course, everybody's true. reaction was rubbish. always, this guy wanted to be a soldier. <laughs> I was a captain in the army, and nobody could tell me anything. I knew all there was to know about the whole world. And the whole of Western history was leading up to the point where Northrop Fry and I would come together. <laughs> uh, and what actually happened was nothing like that. He basically uh, taught his books, and almost word for word, he would lecture and then ask a question. And then he'd pick out one, and they'd say something, and he'd say yes. And it was the ultimate affirmation. But they'd largely done uh, courses with Fry before, or they'd read the books very carefully, or whatever. So they had an idea of what the, you know, the moves would be. Where I thought it was going to pay off was when Fry was teaching the four quartets. In my mind, it was clearly something to do with uh, Kipling's short story, They. He started asking about this passage. And just before it, there's an image of two figures or figures walking on the dead leaves. And he said, who are these? And I thought, well, that's close enough. So before anybody get, I got my hand up, and I said, well, surely, uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Fry, this has to do with um, Kipling's short story, They. And, and I, I was sort of, this is great, you know. And then he, he just turned to me and he said, looked at me in, in, in that incredibly cold, glassy way he could and said, he said, the mechanical identification of illusions is not really going to get us very far, is it? And at that moment, this great black hole opened in front of me and I, and I fell in. From what height fallen, so much the stronger proved he with his thunder. Till then, who knew the force of those dire arms? I first read Milton, the first two books of Paradise Lost, when I was uh, about 15. And um, I could not believe how uh, easy it was to read and um, what a great story it was. And I just got completely wrapped up in the thing. This was a story about um, this wonderful um, figure, I mean, you know, Satan, the, who was in rebellion. At that point, uh, reading that poem was not really that much different to watching some great epic movie or something. And uh, I never got past it, in a way. It, no student reads Paradise Lost without being affected by Satan. In trying to solve that problem, of why they like Satan, you can actually open up the continuity between the 17th century and our culture in such a way that illuminates both. You have a background <laughs> uh, in the army, and right. it, it is interesting. It's unusual 
Um, pretty atypical. Yeah, at least for a professor. Uh, I, 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 I honestly don't know. I mean, I got my stereotypical answers to, uh, you know, the army and everything. But I, in the end of the day, I don't know why I was in the army. I, what I do know is that, is that uh, a lot of the experiences were so um, important, powerful, overwhelming, um, that I would not give them up for anything and I would not be who I am now. My feeling was that with teaching there was a very easy transference from um, the way that you behave with a platoon uh, to the way that you behave with classes. One of the things that you realize is that you're not in control, that it really is about the students, is the quality of that class is the students. Last year was the 400th anniversary of uh, Milton's birth uh, in 1608. What it seems to me to have happened over the course of that year is that people became aware that Milton has little or no popular audience. Okay, What I mean by that is outside of school or university, people don't really read that much Milton. They don't know that much about Milton. And, you know, if you think about it, there's no movie called Milton in Love. <laughs> Al Pacino, you know, Al Pacino and Gwyneth Paltrow are not busting, you know, to play the blind poet and his wife, the scent of Mary Powell. Uh, what this produced, <laughs> what this produced was enormous, among Miltonists, was an enormous Shakespeare envy. <laughs> because the guy who is, does have the popular audience, uh, obviously is Shakespeare. And what this led to was all kinds of, uh, of increasingly wild claims uh, uh, for Milton or about Milton. Uh, one book, a Harvard book, took, it, took the, the, the bull by the horns and said, look, the point is Milton is better than Shakespeare. And in the whole of that book, he actually never said anything about Shakespeare, <laughs> just went on and on about Milton. The other move is to say things like, Milton is the father of the American Revolution. Without, uh, without Milton, had not Jefferson read Areopagitica, uh, <laughs> there would be no Declaration of, uh, of Independence. There would be no Barack Obama. And, that, and I remember that wonderful hat that Aretha Franklin was wearing? We would not have got that. <laughs> OK, the third move is that Milton is the father of science fiction. And had it not been for Milton, we would not have got the novels of C.S. Lewis. Not the most compelling argument, it seems to me. <laughs> All right. What I want to suggest is that what everybody remembers about Milton is Satan. It's almost like it's Satan stupid. What Satan does, what Milton's Satan does, it leads us to the heart of Milton's relevance. And what I want to do in the next 45 minutes is to work through uh, the phases of the historic phases of reception of Milton's sa Satan since the publication to the present day. And there seem to me to be three major phases. The first one is the one that develops over the 18th century, which is the Romantic Satan. The second one, which develops over the 20th century through the efforts of scholars and academics, is what we might call, for the sake of argument, the academic Satan. And the third one, is what I think, or what I want to call, Milton's Satan. The point about Paradise Lost, as its name suggests, is that it's about loss. It's about suffering. It's about pain. It's about the things that we most, most fear in life. And it's, attempt to, and it's an attempt to come to some kind of understanding of what those things are. The first question, it represents, it sets itself up as a mystery. It's a mystery story. How did it happen? How did it happen that we have to live like this? How did it happen that we were expelled from the garden, from the locus of desire? How did it happen that death was introduced into the world? How did it happen that we inherit a universe of death? The great synecdoche in our culture for that universe of death 
is Auschwitz. And so it doesn't seem to me it's not irrelevant to recall that because there's a way in which that's what Milton is talking about, is the capacity for human beings, for human life, to reproduce this universe of death. Milton's immediate answer, being a good Christian, is simply biblical. Who got us into this situation? And he says straight away, he it was, the infernal serpent, Satan. And, okay, the problem is that Milton's Satan doesn't seem to be terribly biblical. As soon as you start reading, uh, it becomes uh, immediately apparent that there's something odd with this Satan. That was the reaction of people as soon as the poem was published. Dryden, who had worked with Milton uh, as a young man uh, in Cromwell's government, said straight away, this cuts us all out. We've got no chance. None of us can produce a poem like this. The thing that worried people from the beginning uh, or disturbed them was the representation of Satan. So another one of, of uh, Milton's earlier colleagues uh, from the Cromwell government, Andrew Marvel, doubted the intent of the poem, he says in his own poem on Paradise Lost. And he said he wondered whether in the representation of Satan, uh, Milton would ruin the sacred truths. Another correspondent, or another uh, reader of the poem, somebody that, that Maria up there is familiar with, uh, John Beale. Uh, this is a royalist country parson, and he writes to John Evelyn about the poem. And this is only a few years after Milton's death. He says that Milton's the only decent poem, poet that the Puritans, the fanatics, ever produced. He said, but the problem is, even he mistakes the main point of poetry. To put such long and horrible blasphemies in the mouth of Satan as no man that fears God can endure to read it or survive it without a poisonous impression. Satan was clearly a problem. And you can understand why they felt he was a problem. Y you know, most of you are familiar with those, those, uh, those, the, the speeches in book one. As soon as, Mil as soon as Satan starts speaking in book one, you know you've got a problem on your hand. There's nothing like this. Uh, it, this it's certainly not biblical. Milton's, this is the first speech that Satan makes. Yet not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change. Though changed in outward luster, that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit that with the mightiest raised me to contend and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed that durst dislike his reign and me preferring his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne. What though the field be lost, all is not lost. To sue and seek for grace, bollocks to that. <laughs> you can imagine how that got to me, reading that as a 15-year-old schoolboy. It's terrific. The point about Satan is he's not simply indomitable. He's also sympathetic and sensitive. But Satan is not lacking in imagination or resourcefulness. And he's a bit like uh, Bill Clinton or Tony Blair in imagining a third way rather than a direct confrontation with heaven or sitting on our asses here in hell and building an empire. What he imagines is a, is a third way, and that third way is a colonial venture. What we're going to do is we're going to get out of here, we're going to cross the ocean of chaos, and we're going to colonize this new world, a new world this, which is at the moment inhabited by God's new indigenes, these puny creatures called humankind. And that's exactly what he does. It's no accident that that colonial venture occurs to Satan. Milton was obsessed with colonial ventures. He came from a family that was heavily involved in those things. 
He actually planned to, to produce an edition of Purchase His Pilgrims, which is a collection of great uh, of voyages of discovery. The impact of this reading of Satan became the orthodoxy uh, over the course of the 18th century. And by the time we get to uh, what's usually called the Romantic period, you cannot move for uh, versions of Satan. He appears everywhere. You cannot pick up a novel where there isn't somebody who sounds like Milton's Satan. If you think of Fenimore Cooper's uh, Last of the Mohicans, it's Magua. If you, if you think of a, um, the, the one that most interests me, or the one that I found um, compelling, just because it was on the TV recently, uh, <laughs> was, um, was Wuthering Heights. And Satan there appears as Heathcliff. And it's, it's a dead ringer. You know it straight away. You even told it because Heathcliff in the movie is carrying a copy of Ivanhoe. <laughs> Every time you see him, he's got a copy of Ivanhoe. And what he would read in Ivanhoe is that there's another satanic character there, Brian de Bois Gilbert. Okay? All these guys are untamed, unbounded, relentless. The problem with the movie with Heathcliff is he looks too much like Fabio. <laughs> that he has, a, he has a really thick set hair and he's roaming across the moors constantly saying, Ooh, Cathy, I do love thee. <laughs> um, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being, obviously I'm being facetious, but, but there is something uh, substantial in this, and it's quite extraordinary how that rebellious, attractive figure of Satan uh, permeates our culture. And you sometimes, you, you, I mean, I was preoccupied, I was watching the other day something about, the artist formerly called Prince. And you could see that this was, this was a kind of left or, or this guy's persona was, was some kind of gesture towards the Byr Byronic hero. The Byronic hero, of course, is, is Byron's version of uh, Milton's Satan. The, the locus classicus for the classical place where you can uh, identify what people, the romantic Satan, this is a, there's lots of places, but this is a quotation from Hazlitt. And this is about 1812. Hazlitt is really uh, bowled over by Milton's Satan. And this is what he says. Satan is the most heroic subject that ever was chosen for a poem. And the execution is as perfect as the design is lofty. The deformity of Satan is only in the depravity of his will. He has no bodily deformity to excite our loathing or disgust. Milton was too open an antagonist to support his argument by the by tricks of a hump and cloven foot. He relied on the justice of his cause and did not scruple to give the devil his due. It's when you read that that you wonder if Hazlitt ever read the, the poem. <laughs> the most obvious thing is when he says that Satan has no physical deformity. The opening image of Satan is not of that heroic figure, the archangel with the scars, but the opening image of Satan is of the chaos monster. He's this great monstrous leviathan lying on the burning lake. When you enter the poem, Satan is drawn directly from the book of Apocalypse. The chaos monster, that's the beast. That's the 666 guy, okay? <laughs> the beast is the consolidated image of evil. It's what in scripture, in Christian scripture. It's the, it's, this is what it is at the end. Now we see evil in one place, consolidated. And that's what happens at the beginning of book one. By the time you get to the end of book one, Satan is completely changed. And you say, well, why did this happen? Well, it happened. You're being told about it all the way through. You've been warned, There's that image of, of Satan as a leviathan, there's that odd uh, simile of this is like a whale, which uh, 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 Norwegian sailors land on thinking it's an island. What appears to be the truth is not the truth. It's quite clear that that's the message. Even more powerfully, towards the end of uh, book one, there's a wonderful image 
of pandemonium has been built. And the rebel angels are trying to get into pandemonium. They've been likened to bees at this stage. So they're imagined as, as insects, but the door is too narrow. They can't get in. They're all squeezing and shuffling. Then all of a sudden, whoop, the door opens, and they all go in. Or sorry, they shrink even further, and they all get in. But once they're inside, they expand to what they really are. The telltale words are that these are the kinds of images that a belated peasant at, uh, at night uh, beyond the Indian mount might see, or dreams he sees. The allusion is to a Midsummer Night's Dream. And Midsummer Night's Dream is being invoked because what you're being told has, is happening is that it's all illusory. That all these grand speeches, the grand venture, everything is a fantasy. What has happened when you enter book one, when you enter hell, is you enter the mind of Satan. You enter the phantasmagoric mind of Satan. You're not seeing things as they really are. Okay. This seems, this seems now obvious, and, it, and it's pretty well incontrovertible. There's not many people that would, that would argue with that. It's not until the end of the 19th century that Paradise Lost began to be studied programmatically in universities. And it's really over the course of the 20th century that the scholars were let loose on it. And the achievement of the scholars is to have dismantled or qualified or radically changed our perception of the romantic Satan. And there are all kinds of ways in which you can point to how this happened. But the key players are in the sort of pantheon of great Milton scholars, uh, people from C.S. Lewis to, um, most importantly, in terms of this dismantling process, or the guy that culminates uh, the process is Stanley Fish with his 1967 book, Surprised by Sin, which is a great book, as is, as is Lewis's book. The, the, and what you begin to see is how, what happens when these guys look extremely closely at the poem. What you begin to see, first of all, is unlike Hazlitt's assertion, the poem is not about Satan at all. In fact, there are three epic poems each one nestled inside the other. The first one begins with Satan, and it begins with a council which sets a course of action. And that course of action is the great colonial venture that Satan undertakes to conquer the world and seduce mankind and bring death and sin into the world. And it comes to fruition in Book 9, when he actually does seduce Adam and Eve and precipitates the fall. But the real epic, the second epic, begins in book three. And it's the divine counsel in book three, which also precipitates a course of action. And the hero heroic figure there is the son of God in relation to humankind. And that heroic action will culminate in books 10 through 12. And, it's, and, those, and there, what you see is the regeneration of Adam and Eve the possibilities for redemption. The third epic is the one that is nestled in the middle. And it's the means by which uh, uh, God actually begins the process of regeneration. It's meant to defend Adam and Eve initially from Satan. And that's the angelic epic. That's Raphael's story of the war in heaven that ultimately leads to, the cr to creation. In a way, that middle story epitomizes the relationship between the satanic epic and the divine epic. What Fish realized, and it wasn't just Fish, Fish articulated it so that it became the new orthodoxy. But people had figured out this, people like uh, Joseph Summers and Anne Ferry had figured out this some time before, and so they anticipate him, is that what is happening with Satan and this is the way you would have been probably all ta taught it in school, was that what is happening with Satan is not that he's a hero, but, it, but that Milton is seducing you. Milton is testing you. It's an entangling. 
It's a teaching by entangling. What I mean by that is, is that you are being put on your metal for those first two books. It's you, uh, any reader, is being, has to work through this stuff and think through this stuff. The essential ground tone or ground note for Milton's thinking is the activity of reading. Reading is an active, critical process. And it's a divine process. It's in the act of reading that we receive God's grace. And this comes out of his Protestantism. It comes out of the doctrine of so sola scriptura, scripture alone. What he's doing with Paradise Lost is creating a poem in which you have to read in the same way that you read scripture. This is, this is not just Fish's argument, but, but, uh, uh, but the, the academic orthodoxy of, of how you're supposed to read this thing. The great proof text for that is in Areopagitica. And this is um, uh, where Milton actually explains uh, what, he, what he thinks, or he, how he imagines uh, what we have to do. And the first point is this. Good and evil, we know in the world, in the field of this world, grow up together almost inseparably. And the knowledge of good is so involved and interwoven with the knowledge of evil and in so many cunning resemblances hardly to be discerned that those confused seeds which were imposed upon Psyche as an incessant labor to cull out and sort asunder were not more intermixed. It was from out of the rind of one apple tasted that the knowledge of good and evil as two twins cleaving together leaped forth into the world and perhaps this is that doom which Adam fell into of knowing good and evil, that is to say, of knowing good by evil. As therefore the state of man is, what wisdom can there be to choose? What continence to forbear without the knowledge of evil? That passage, and what Milton goes on to say, is that that's why reading poetry, reading Spencer, is of more value than reading philosophers, of reading Aquinas because you experience the problem. You don't, it's not simply an appeal to your reason, to your understanding. You actually have to go through it. What Milton understands is that we have, Milton is a, a humanist and a Protestant. And what he understands is that we have two principal weapons at our disposal. And the first one is our God-given reason. And the second one is revelation itself. And as soon as you start thinking this through, you begin to see how it might work on, uh, on his representation of Satan. It means that when Satan says things like, or Beelzebub says things like, fearless, we endangered uh, heaven's perpetual king you know he's talking a load of rubbish because you cannot endanger something that is perpetual. The whole of the rhetoric is run through like that. But even more importantly, the fundamental metaphor of which the poem uh, uses to figure its truth of a subject in rebellion against a king, you are required to go beyond the vehicle of the metaphor and understand its tenor. tenor. The point is that there is a radical difference between a subject being in rebellion against a king and a creature being in rebellion against a creator, or his creator, or her creator. The point is, if you are rebelling against your creator, you are rebelling against the source of your being. You are rebelling against the, your very power to rebel. Abdiel actually explains this to Satan. He makes this clear to him at the end of book five. He says, this is, what is this is what your rebellion means. It's nonsense. This is the point of C.S. Lewis's phrase. When C.S. Lewis says, when, when Satan says in book four, evil be thou my good. 
what C.S. Lewis says is, well, that's rather like saying, nonsense be thou my sense. <laughs> the thing is that the satanic position is illogical. But the genius or cleverness of Milton is to also involve revelation or to root this in revelation so that when Satan says, evil be thou my good, he's actually quoting scripture. And if you know scripture, if you can hear the echoes, then scripture guides you. Because this is, because what he's doing is he's, he's quoting Isaiah 5. And this is what Isaiah 5 says. Satan says, evil be thou my good. And Isaiah 5 says, 520 says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. That's the argument. If you think of that first speech, when Satan talks about shaking God's throne, he never shook God's throne. It's a fantasy. And you know it's a fantasy because it's a quotation from Isaiah 14. This is the most famous passage on Satan, Lucifer, in Scripture. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? My point is that the echo, the scriptural echo, corrects the reading. It's not only our reason, but it's our reason in tandem with the book of Revelation. So what you get is that if, you, if the, the tag, the most famous way of talking about the romantic, or the most famous articulation with the romantic Satan, is that Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it. That's Blake. What you might now say is that the devil of, is of Milton's party without knowing it, and that party is God's party. That's the academic Milton. And it's formidable. It's the orthodoxy. Stanley Fish articulated uh, this uh, wonderful argument, not entirely in the way that I put it, but basically this in 1967. And it's reigned supreme for 40 years. And Stanley loves it, and he will not <laughs> give in. And one of the great dramas of Milton's studies is to see Stanley defending this position against all comers. It's quite heroic. I mean, it's, it's almost Job-like. And it's, uh, you know, and I, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not being mean. You know, Stanley's formidable. And if Stanley was here, he'd, he'd run rings around me. But there's a problem. And the problem is that the Milton that emerges from the academic account is somebody that you simply don't recognize in the prose. There's masses of prose that he wrote, masses of pamphlets and books. And the Milton that you see there, and the academic Milton that is controlling Paradise Lost, they're just not the same people. What you get with the academic Milton is this kind of know-all figure who's completely in control of everything, who's manipulating you and making you do things and kind of laughing when you screw up and think Satan's a good guy. That's the first problem. The second problem is that it tends to uh, encourage a loss of focus uh, on what exactly does evil mean. I'm not sure exactly how to get into what now it seems to me is. So we've got the romantic Milton and the academic Milton. And what I want to suggest is that there's, uh, sorry, the, the academic, uh, the romantic Satan uh, and, the, uh, and the academic Satan. And what I want to suggest is there's Milton Satan. And Milton Satan is actually neither of these guys. One way into it is to go back to uh, the great synecdoche for evil in our century, which is uh, uh, the Nazi persecution. And, 
and the culminating synecdoche of Auschwitz. The, uh, the book that seems most helpful is Hannah Arendt's uh, great analysis of the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem in the early 60s. What is interesting about that analysis is not the banality of evil. The banality of evil is the idea that Eichmann was not a monster, he was not the chaos monster, he was not the beast of the apocalypse, he was an ordinary man. He was an ordinary man who got caught up in a vast bureaucratic machine, a vast bureaucratic machine that just happened to be dedicated to, to the industrialized mass production slaughter of millions of people. And there's something to that argument. Um, I said to some of you that the, the, the story that I can never get past with Eichmann is his insistence, it's not in Arendt's book, it's in the trial tale, his insistence that he had not been cruel when he put 120 people into a, a railway carriage going to Auschwitz. And he said that this carriage was designed to carry 100 soldiers. And those soldiers would all be carrying their equipment. So the, the Jews who were in this carriage didn't have any equipment. So obviously you could put in another 20. He could not see. He simply could not see that this was a problem. It just seemed to him logical. At this point, what you can talk about is instrumentalism. And you can say that the instrumentalism of his occupation was blinding him. But the thing that I'm most interested in is not so much uh, the instrumentalism, or, um, but is much more to do with the way that Eichmann is locked into a particular narrative. And the particular narrative is his life when he joined the Nazi party, when he joined the SS, it suddenly had meaning because he joined this great national narrative. And this is the way that, that uh, Arendt puts it. From a humdrum life without significance and consequence, the wind had blown him into history as he understood it, namely into a movement that always kept moving and in which somebody like him, already a failure in the eyes of his social class, of his family, and hence his own eyes as well, could start from scratch and still make a career. In all the course of the trial, Eichmann will never step out of that story, the story of Germany's struggle to realize its destiny. It seems to me that this is exactly the same, or much like Satan. Satan has a number of grand stories, but most importantly, the grand story of his struggle with God. And he will never really step outside it. In book, book four, he comes close to it. In book four, he does do some kind of self-analysis, but he returns to the story. I'm going to continue to go on. Unlike either Eichmann or Satan, Milton was capable of stepping outside his story. And the evidence for that, I want to suggest, is the creation of his character called Satan. That Satan is an auto-critique. Satan is Milton analyzing himself. People say, who's Milton Satan? Oh, it's Charles I. And the latest flurry, which has been going for about 10 years, is that it's Cromwell. Obviously, it's Cromwell, because Cromwell betrayed the revolution. It may be both of these guys, but more, most importantly, it's Milton. It's Milton analyzing himself. It's Milton admitting his culpability. It's Milton admitting his failures, and his failures were considerable. Milton was wedded to a great national narrative in exactly the same way that Eichmann was and exactly the same way that Satan is. You cannot move for Milton talking about that narrative until 1660 and the king returns to power. It's the idea, and to use his phrase, a new Rome in the West. England will become a new Rome in the West. It will be the locus of civility. It will be the locus of freedom of conscience. 
It's a great image, and the image is most powerfully articulated in Areopagitica. He never gets it as powerfully as that again. Milton, in some ways, knows what kind of dangers adherence to this particular narrative will produce. The narrative, instead of being liberating or enabling, can become a solipsism. It can become simply a self-reflection that you're caught in it. And you say, well, uh, Eichmann and Satan clearly went on to perpetrate or become the instruments of extraordinary atrocities. This is irrelevant to Milton. Well, I would suggest it's actually not. Uh, Milton was no Eichmann, and he's certainly not Satan. Uh, but there, are, uh, there is certainly blood on Milton's hands. And there are a number of ways that you can demonstrate this. The first way is the way that he advocated, encouraged and advocated, uh, uh, the uh, English retribution in, in Ireland in 1649 to 50. Some of his articulations are extreme. This is from Iconoclastes. And this is just after, he published this just after the massacre at Droida. He didn't know about the massacre at Droida, uh, but he knew about other atrocities in, uh, or, or excesses in Ireland. And this is what he says. A nation by just war and execution has the right to slay whole families of them who so barbarously had slain whole families before. If somebody has slain your family, you have the right to slay their family. Not the person culpable, but the family. Did not all Israel do as much against the Benjaminites for one rape, co rape committed by a few? Even more powerfully than this, is his role in the execution of the king. In the, on the 23rd of February in 1642, Stephen Marshall made a sermon, to, gave a sermon to Parliament. And in that sermon, the argument was for moral clarity. We're about to go to war against the king. The argument is for moral clarity. You're either for us, against us. And this is, this is not a cheap shot against George Bush. This is what he says. He actually quotes that. You are either for us or against us. But more importantly, he produces an analysis of Psalm 137. And this is devastating. The, farm, the, the psalm is, is disturbing, uh, whichever way you run it. But Marshall's analysis of it is even worse, or is even more problematic. 137 is one that you all know. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget the O Israel, let my right hand forget her cunning. Remember, O Lord, the children of Adam in the day of Jerusalem, those who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Jerusalem, sorry, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Marshall takes this psalm head on. He's talking to the assembled houses of parliament. The speech was an enormous hit, and it was republished over and over again. Marshall is a friend of Milton. And this is what Marshall says. What soldier's heart would not start at this? Not only when he, is in, when he is hot in blood to cut down armed enemies in the field, but afterward deliberately to come into a subdued city and take the little ones upon spear's point, to take them by the heels and beat out their brains against the walls. What inhumanity and barbarousness would this be thought? Yet if this work be to revenge God's church against Babylon, he is a blessed man that takes and dashes the little ones against the stones. Milton's response to that, the great cry that Marshall put up in this speech was, no cold neuters, no neutrals. You're either for it or against it. Milton repeats it. 
in his apology of April 1642, he repeats that call, no cold neuters. But the problem gets complicated because seven years later, they're faced, both Marshall and Milton, are faced with the moral decision to whether to support or not support the execution of the king. The morality of the king's execution is dubious, to say the least. But parliament, or really parliament dominated by the army, uh, led by Cromwell, decided that the king had to go. They had enormous difficulty trying to figure out a way in which uh, they could make charges stick. But they decided, and the king was executed. Marshall backed off. Marshall and other Presbyterian ministers produced a pamphlet saying this was wrong. Milton produced a pamphlet saying it was right. But the pamphlet is extraordinary because in the pamphlet, he represents Marshall and the Presbyterians as the weird sisters in Macbeth. They juggled. They allured us. They led us on. No cold neuters, they said, and we followed. And now they back off. And in what seems to me to be the most devastating parapraxis or Freudian slip, Milton likens himself to Macbeth. And he actually says, we're so far forward in blood now, it's easier to go on as to come back. He doesn't literally say those words, but the allusions are so powerfully there that it's unmistakable. The Milton in the tenure of kings and magistrates is an intensely conflicted, guilt-ridden person. Myself am hell. The idea that he's somebody who is utterly removed from Satan is untenable. It then comes as, it should then come as no surprise that the model for Satan, or one of the principal models for Satan, is Macbeth. Something that Helen Gardner pointed out years ago is that Satan is not biblical. He comes out of the Renaissance drama. He comes out of Faustus and Iago and Macbeth. It doesn't simply have to be Macbeth, but what I'm trying to do is suggest that there's a connection there. What I'm trying to suggest then is that Milton's Satan is certainly about Milton. It's that... Uh, Milton was of the devil's party. He knew it, and he despised himself for it. And that in the, the sanity of Milton, it seems to me, the greatness of Milton is understanding this and representing it and pulling it out so that we can see it. There are innumerable other examples of Milton's devastating ability to step outside the grand narrative unlike Eichmann or Satan himself. And that, it seems to me, is his redemption. The, Satan does not, the virtues that the, the people who, uh, all of us that read Satan and see this great figure, the virtues of Satan are not lost. What it seems to me to, what seems to, me to happen is that in Paradise Lost, they are recreated and they survive, they're alive and well in a self-knowing version of Satan, a self-knowing version of the figure who is willing to challenge authority and not take things on, uh, um, on writ. And that's the sun. And the passage that I re re return to over and over again, the thing that seems to me to be uh, Milton, at his, Milton at his finest moment is when in book three, the son challenges God the Father. He does not accept that horrible, teacherly God the Father's account of justice. And he says there has, the son says, there has to be mercy. And you can hear Satan in this. For should man finally be lost, should man thy creature late so loved, thy youngest son fall circumvented thus by fraud, so should thy goodness and thy greatness both be questioned and blasphemed without defense. The sun's no wanker. 
what I'm trying to suggest then is that there's a way in which uh, Milton's Satan takes us, it, once you begin to read Milton's Satan in terms of uh, the things that actually happen in Milton's life, it takes on a new force. It doesn't blanket out either the romantic Satan or the academic Satan, but it's a new dimension. And that new dimension leads to all kinds of other places. But that's for another day. Thanks very much. <laughs>